Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my August 2018 reading wrap-up. So, you may remember several months ago, I was doing these wrap-ups in a, in a sort of a, a suit and tie and whatnot. I figured why not do it in a hoodie and a hat now, because my hair is long enough so I can kind of style it out. So, I read about... I think I worked it out actually, let me see. So I read 25 books in the month of August, uh, a lot of them were quite small which is kind of why I've been hitting the 20s, I've been reading my Penguin Mini Moderns. Uh, it was an okay reading month, it doesn't really stand out to be honest, it's probably not my, not my best. I mean my quantity or number of pages read or whatever is always pretty similar because I have kind of a reading routine. Which maybe I'll do a video about at some point. I don't know. Let me know if you want a video on that. On like how I read or whatever. Without further ado, let's get started with book number one. So that was Betty Frieden, The Problem That Has No Name. This is Penguin Mini Modern number 41. I'll read you the blurb. I always do with these. The pioneering Betty Frieden gave voice to countless American housewives who, despite being sold a dream of the perfect home and family, silently wondered, is this all? And set the women's movement in motion. So... Basically, the problem that has no name, I've forgotten how I worded it because it's been a while now, but I think I said something like, the problem that has no name is basically just like the inherent gender bias in our society, basically. So this was uh, written at quite a pivotal time, I mean, it was published in 1963, and it was basically like a call to action for women, saying... Um, not even that, I guess. It was more a chronicle of the fact that there were these women out there who were standing up and saying, you know, I want to do this in my life. I want to do that. I don't want to just, you know, get married to my husband and have 2.4 children and spend, you know, all day doing the washing up and running little Johnny to and from baseball practice. She was like, no, I don't want that. I want something more interesting from life. So, yeah, this chronicles those women. It's pretty badass. I'll give it a four out of five. Up next, we have Indisputably Doris by Charles Heathcote. I, I guess, shall I read the blurb for all of these? No, that'd be too long. There'd be too many of these. So I won't read the blurb for this. This is book two in Charlie Heathcote's Our Doris series. They're kind of a series of humorous monologues told from the perspective of, of R. Harold, which is Doris's long-suffering husband. It's very, like, northern sense of humour. Draws on things like dinner ladies and keeping up appearances, those sort of old... Uh, British TV, you know, comedy shows. Charlie is a booktuber as well. He's here on Booktube, and I would recommend checking out his channel. He reads some interesting stuff. He also talks about his writing process. He's currently writing his third book, but it's not in the Ardoris series. It's in his new secret project, which he's kind of said himself, you can find information on if you want to, but because he's not, like, actively sharing the information, I figure, well, that's probably what he wants to do so I'm, I'm no idea what he's working on there but I'm looking forward to it especially if R. Doris and Indisputably Doris are anything to go by. So this one is the second book of the series I actually thought was better than the first. I'm gonna give it a I'm gonna give it a 5 out of 5. Let's give it a 5 out of 5 for the purposes of this. It's somewhere between a 4.5 and a 5 out of 5 for me and I would de definitely recommend reading these books if you check out Anthony Andrews uh, over on his channel on booktube he's doing an R. Doris read along for the first two books as well so uh, I encourage you to go and check that out support indie authors especially when they're good ones alright number three I got this from a car boot sale here in High Wycombe actually at the time of filming it's on tomorrow so I want to go again and see if I can find some more books but I picked up Little Miss Bad by Roger Hargreaves little children's book, you know? I mean, I read all the, well, I say that. I, I used to like the Mr. Men books, but I didn't necessarily have many of them. I used to get them from like libraries and stuff. My mum always used to say that I reminded her of Mr. Bump, and basically someone was selling this for 20p. So I was like, right, I'm gonna get it and read it. And I did, and it was a, uh, a 3.5 out of five. I mean, I don't know how to rate a Mr. Man book as a 29 year old man, it's quite difficult. Okay, then we have Fortune Box by Madeline Swan. I should point out that this book and Indisputably Doris, I both read both of those for Tarden Danes, indie read-along, and shot a big, you know, double-barreled review of both of those books that I'll link to below. This is pretty much bizarro fiction in kind of short stories that also all tie together into like an overall theme, if that makes sense. So it's almost like a novella, but it's also a, a collection of short stories. Enjoyable enough. Again, Madeline Swan is here on uh, YouTube, doing a bit of booktube, a bit of authortube. 
And if you've never read Bizarro as a genre, actually, this is probably a pretty good place to start, I would say, because also it's not too long. I enjoyed it enough. I think I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Um, yeah, I mean, probably doesn't help that Bizarro isn't necessarily my genre of choice, but pretty good stuff. And uh, yeah, another indie. Okay, then we have a Soul Bellow, Leaving the Yellow House. And uh, the blurb for this one, this is Penguin Mini Modern number 36. A stubborn, hard-drinking elderly woman living in a desert town finds herself faced with an impossible choice in this coarsely funny, precisely observed tale from an American prose master. Gotta be honest, I don't really remember it at this point, so I have to give it a 3.5 out of 5, because if it was bad it would have stood out, and if it was good it would have really stood out. I do think it was okay, from what I remember of it. And uh, you may be wondering why this is 36, when I said earlier I read number 41, and that's because this one was on my shelf. Uh, <laughs> basically I have different shelves and uh, maybe again I could talk about this in my how I read video but this was on a different shelf and I forgot about it and then I realized it was missing and I was like where is it gone and it took me ages to find it I almost ordered another copy of it okay then we have a Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare this is a really old edition of it uh, Oxford at the Clarendon Press edited by FC Horwood tutor of St Catherine Society Oxford very nice uh, I did figure, oh yeah, here we go, first published in 1939, this is the 1948 reprint, so it was kind of cool to read it in this edition, it's also got notes on it here and there, a few like pencil marks during the play, and then like these little, you know, it's got old school stamp and stuff, so all in all it was a pretty cool edition of it, it's not my favourite Shakespeare play, but Shakespeare is still Shakespeare and very much worth reading, ooh, I'd, ooh, yeah, 3.5 out of 5 for me, this one. Then we have Penguin Mini Modern at number 42, Frederico Garcia Lorca, The Dialogue of Two Snails. A dazzling selection of the beautiful, brutal, and darkly brilliant work of Spain's greatest 20th century poet, from his beloved gypsy ballads to pieces appearing in English for the first time. And this was some poetry. As I usually do with poetry, actually, I'll read you some of the poetry out so you can get a feel for whether it's your kind of thing. So, for example, Conjuring. The convulsing hand, like a Medusa, blinds the doleful eye of the oil lamp. Ace of clubs, sign of the scissory cross. Above the white smoke of incense, it has something akin to a burrowing mole and indecisive butterfly. Ace of clubs, sign of the scissory cross. It clutches an invisible heart. Do you see the hand clutching? A heart reflected in the wind. Ace of clubs, sign of the scissory cross. I mean, I quite enjoy that kind of poetry. I enjoyed this. I will give it a 4 out of 5. It's probably not the best poetry collection in the Penguin Midi Moderns, but it's up there. Anyway, here we have Going Solo by Roald Dahl. I also did a review of this, which I'll link to below. And this is basically Dahl's second volume of autobiography slash memoir. His first one is called Boy and covers his childhood. I do think Boy was better. Here in Going Solo, he basically starts out working for Shell, and then there is the outbreak of the Second World War, and then he joins the RAF, and he ends up in Greece, kind of pretty much getting chased out of Greece by the Nazis. And this is basically his memoir of that. I did enjoy the, the first part more where he was with Shell, I think he was in Africa. Uh, yeah, African safaris and deadly snakes. And um, yeah, then when the war broke out, unfortunately for me, it was it, it glamorized war too much, if that makes sense. Like, it was a war memoir, and sometimes I think those can be really good and really well well done. But I think Dahl's take on it, it just had too much of that, like, old boy, you know, the old boys army club, talking about the good old days when, you know, they were chasing the, the bloody crowds. No offence if you're German. I like Germany. I went to Berlin recently. It was nice. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I can't remember what I gave it, but it's like a 3.5 out of 5. Here we have Yuko Chishima of Dogs and Walls, Penguin Mini Modern at number 43. Two luminous, tender stories from one of Japan's greatest 20th century writers, showing how childhood memories, dreams, and fleeting encounters shape our lives. Now, I'm going to have to give it a 3 out of 5, because the last one that I gave 3.5 out of 5 and didn't really remember, I did kind of remember bits of it. I remembered, like, the feelings, maybe, as opposed to what actually happened. That, I just, I don't remember at all. William Shakespeare, Richard II, uh, I was just on a Shakespeare hype, I guess, over the last couple of months. You've got uh, Roy E. Reeds to, to thank for that, actually. This one didn't have any annotations, and I only made one note in it. However, I did enjoy it because I, 
I don't know. I don't know too much about Richard the Second, but I enjoyed learning about Richard the Second. I don't know. I that that kind of period of, of history in general, I just find quite interesting. And so to see a Shakespearean take on it, you know, I mean, if you think about it, a lot of Shakespeare's more historic plays, he was writing to like at a point that was closer to them than we're reading them now. If that makes sense, I'll give it a three point five out of five. I, I would like to see this performed. I think it could be really good. Although, I guess then I'd want to see Richard III. But whatever. Penguin Mini Modern number 44. Javier, Javier Marias. Madame du Dauphin and the Idiots. Five sparkling, irreverent, brief portraits of famous literary figurines. Including libertines, eccentrics and rogues. From Spain's greatest living writer. Oh, that's right. I noticed with this one. This is the first one so far, I think. Where the author's been alive. I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I always check the dates and it's always like they're always dead. Actually, fascinating. I mean, if you're like a bookish person, you'll really enjoy this. So we have a, a read of the titles of the stories. We have Madame du Dauphin and the Idiots, Nabokov in Raptures, Juna Barnes in Silence, Oscar Wilde after Prison, and Emily Bronte, the Silent Major. And actually, the Emily Bronte essay in particular I found super interesting. And I, I talked about it in one of my reading blogs. I would... I'd probably recommend getting this, you know, even if you don't get any of the others, because this is just a bookish book, you know. 4.5 out of 5, thinking back to it. This is one of the few Penguin mini moderns I'd like to reread. Alright, then we have Seth Godin, Lynchpin, Are You Indispensable? How to Drive Your Career and Create a Remarkable Future. This is another one that I did a review of, so I'll link to that below. Basically, it's a business book and a non-fiction sort of self-help style. And it's basically all about how... You as an employee want to make yourself indispensable. You know, you want to be the kind of employee that when you leave, a company falls apart without or whatever, you know. And at the same time as a company, you want to attract these people and you want to nurture them and keep them. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting little read. Uh, I think I gave it a, I don't know, I'll, I'll give it a 3.5 thinking about it. Because one of the problems with it is that it is quite, like, circuitous. Like, a lot of the stuff kind of starts to repeat itself after a while. But also, it does, you know, it inspires you and it gives you a little kick up the backside. I mean, for me, I no longer work for a, an organisation. I work for myself. But I can take that same concept and try and become like a linchpin for my clients, you know? All right, here we have Carson McCullough's The Haunted Boy, Penguin Mini Modern number 45. From a master of Southern Gothic, these moving stories portray love, sorrow, and a search for happiness and understanding. Now, I thought these were going to maybe be like horror going into them, but they weren't really. It was more... I mean, the haunted boy was haunted by something he'd seen, you know, by like a vision he'd had, like a premonition. But yeah, these stories were all right. They were, you know, they were haunting in that sense, in in that, in that sense that they weren't like, they won't give you bad dreams or anything like that, but they'll stick with you. Uh, it's not quite a four for me, though. It's a 3.75 out of five for me. I'm trying to convince Biggie to come and sit with me. Oh, here he is. He came along. Hello, Biggie. Should we finish this wrap up then? Okay, so next up we have Penguin Midi Modern number 46, and that is The Garden of Forking Paths by Georges Louise Borges. Butchered that name entirely. I'm not even in shot. Let me fix that. And this is uh, Fantastical Tales of Mazes, Puzzles, Lost Labyrinths, and Bookish Mysteries from the Unique Imagination of a Literary Magician. I mean, how can you not love a book when it's got a blurb like that, you know? The quote on the inside cover as well is, Summer was drawing to a close, and I realised that the book was monstrous. We have uh, five stories here. So we have The Garden of Forking Paths, The Book of Sand, The Circular Ruins, On Exactitude and Science, and Death and the Compass. It's just thought-provoking stuff, you know? I'll give it a... Uh, this is another 3.75 out of 5 for me. Okay, next up, Biggie, we have, we have The Passage by Justin Cronin. Do you remember this? This was my bedside book. So uh, I read probably the good two-thirds of this with Biggie on my lap eating treats while I was reading it in bed. And uh, this started out as a buddy read with Mara from books like Woe and somebody else, I can't remember who. Sorry Biggie, I can't stroke you all the time because I need to show the people the book. And yeah, basically, I don't know, we went into it with high hopes because it's like a booktube darling almost. And none of us liked it. 
I, I'm giving it a 2 out of 5 here. Uh, Mara gave it a 2.5 out of 5, I think. And I think the other person, who I can't remember who it was that we read it with, they gave it a 2 out of 5 as well. Um, it did get like slightly better towards the end, but it just dragged and dragged. And honestly, I feel like this entire trilogy could probably have just been one book. Or alternatively, three books that were like this this long, you know? So, um, yeah. Uh, d don't read this. Don't waste your time. Okay, then I listened to The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle on audiobook. So I actually listened to this with Becca. We had the Stephen Fry audiobook of it. And uh, this was for the, the Catalyst Reads Rereadathon. So the prompt this month was uh, poetry, short stories, or a graphic novel. So we went for this, short stories. And it kind of ties back to we listened to The Sign of the Four earlier this year as, uh, you know, reread an old favourite or something like that, or a book you studied, I think. And uh, I didn't enjoy that one as much at, at that time. I'll link to the reviews of that and to this below. But, um, yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed it this, this, this time round. Uh, Becca enjoyed it as well. It's got some of my favourite short stories in it as well. So, for example, let me see, where's the index? Um, the Red-Headed League, love that story. Uh, that's about lots of ginger people, which is always good. We have the Five Orange Pips, that's a good one. The Adventure of the Speckled Band. Biggie, Biggie, what are you doing? I know. So yeah, five out of five for me. Okay, then we have The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, and this was illustrated by Chris Riddell. I thought this started strong, but started to drag towards the end. It's basically about, you know, a, a kid called Nobody Owens who's raised in a graveyard. The illustrations are fantastic, I'm not going to lie. And it is very imaginative and well written and whatnot. It's just, maybe I wasn't in the mood for it at the time or something. I don't know. Like I say, I really enjoyed the start of it, but towards the end it just dragged for me. I did enjoy... It kind of reminded me of Terry Pratchett in places, especially to the Johnny and the Dead books, which is kind of a similar thing of a, a kid in a graveyard. But Johnny and the Dead was better, so I would say just read Johnny and the Dead. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm working through Neil Gaiman stuff because I find him quite hit and miss. I either love his stuff or don't particularly care for it. And so um, this was one I didn't particularly care for, but... It wasn't a bad book either, so you know, 3.5 out of 5. Alright, then we have Isaac Asimov, Earth is Room Enough. This was my next bedroom book, actually, after I finished reading The Passage. I absolutely flew through this. The uh, final story in this is called Dreaming is a Private Thing, and is basically about, in the future, people can record dreams and you can buy dreams commercially. And that influenced an album called Dreamies by Bill Holt. It's one of my favourite albums. It's kind of almost a concept album. Two like 25 minute tracks that bring together mixing and stuff back in the day when you couldn't really do that very easily. So you did it all on like a, like a, tape, tra a tape track. But he took the name of that album, Dreamies, from that short story. But all of these short stories are pretty good, to be honest, and uh, I'm glad I finally picked it up after putting this off for a while. Then we have They Do It With Mirrors. This is a Miss Marple book by Agatha Christie. I didn't think it was her best. Uh, I, I kind of... Uh, well, I guess the problem is, is with the setup of it all and the title of it, you kind of know roughly how it was done. And so you just... The guessing or whatever and your participation of reading it as a murder mystery... It's at the level at which you kind of already kind of know what's happened and you've just got to flesh out the details, which made it less fun. Uh, the setting was good, though. It was set in like a, an old Victorian mansion that had been converted into like a sanatorium. It's a, it says a rehabilitation centre for delinquents. So I did like that setting, but it was just a slow burner and not Christie at her finest. As said, Agatha Christie at her worst is still better than most at their best. It's a weak 3.5 out of 5, same as the Graveyard book for me, really. I mean, if, if it, you know, I can totally see why people would like this book. It just, uh, it didn't really do much for me. Okay, then we have Fame by Andy Warhol, Penguin Mini Modern number 47. The legendary pop artist Andy Warhol's hilarious, gossipy vignettes and aphorisms on the topics of love, fame and beauty. And it does almost read like a quotes book or something like that. We have love, senility. Beauty and fame, those are the three topics. I will read you a, a little bit, actually. Um, 
Let's do beauty. Everybody's sense of beauty is different from everybody else's. When I see people dressed in hideous clothes that look all wrong on them, I try to imagine the moment when they were buying them and thought, this is great, I like it, I'll take it. You can't imagine what went off in their heads to make them buy those maroon polyester waffle iron pants or that acrylic halter top that has Miami written in glitter. You wonder what they rejected as not beautiful, an, acry an acrylic halter top that had Chicago. On the, on the topic of love, we have a drag queen I know is waiting for a real man to fall in love with him slash her. I always run into strong women who are looking for weak men to dominate them. All in all, loved it. Uh, 4.5 out of 5 for me. Strong. I've uh, never really read any of Andy Warhol's stuff before. I have seen one of his movies called Blowjob, which is literally a close-up of somebody's face while that is happening. But... Um, yeah, that makes me sound weird. I watched it because art, damn you, art. But uh, it was it was interesting to read some of his. Well, I don't I don't know if you'd even call it written stuff because I think a lot of it is just like verbal stuff that he actually said. But uh, you know, fascinating to read nonetheless. Then we have Neil Usher, The Elemental Workplace, The Twelve Elements for Creating a Fantastic Workplace for Everyone. This is non-fiction. I actually read this because I'm being paid to do like. Almost like spark notes of business books. So um, this was the first one that I did for that. The client was very happy with what I came up with. I should probably just link you to that, to be honest. But I don't know if I'm allowed to. So I won't. But um, yeah, it was all right. It just talked about the kind of things you need to put into a workplace to make it work for people and to make it more productive. It's quite relevant for me because obviously I work from home. And I want to be able to kind of create a space that works well for me both at home and at work. But um at the same time, I don't really have any space or anything like that. So I have more constraints than most. But I think what you kind of take from this book is that there's always something you can do. You know, there's always a way to improve it. Okay, then we have Primo Levi, the survivor, number 48. From the writer who bore witness to the 20th century's darkest days, these verses of beauty and horror include the poem that inspired the title of his memoir, If This Is a Man. Bye, Biggie. And so, um, as, as I always do with my... You know, poetry sets, I read a little bit, so we're flicking at random. Here we go. In the beginning, August 13th, 1970. It says here, In the beginning is the first word of Holy Scripture. I probably pronounced it wrong and offended people, I'm sorry. On the Big Bang, to which allusion is made, see the example Scientific American, June 1970. So this was written at a time before the Big Bang was kind of widely known as a theory, I guess. So, in the beginning... Fellow men for whom a year is long, a century of venerable gold, exhausted earning your bread, worn out, enraged, deluded, sick and lost, hear and be consoled and mocked. Twenty billion years ago, splendid, moving through both space and time, there was a globe of flame, alone, eternal, our common father and our executioner, and it exploded and all change began. Even now the faint echo from this one catastrophe reversal sounds from the far ends of the universe. Everything was born from that one spasm, the same abyss that embraces us and taunts us, the same time that gives us life and ruins us, everything each of us has thought, the eyes of every woman we have loved, sons by the thousand too, and this hand that writes. It's alright, it's okay poetry. Probably a 3.5 out of 5, I mean it's hard to not enjoy the poetry that you get in these Penguin Mini Modern collections really, because even if it's not your kind of poetry for like 60 pages you can appreciate it. Uh, that's as far as I got with the Penguin Mini Moderns this month, by the way. So next month, I'm hoping to finish them off and do like a, I don't know, something with all, all 50 of them. And then I'm going to start my vintage Mini Moderns. Very exciting. Then I picked up The Amityville Horror by Jay Anson. So we read this as part of the buddy reads I've been doing. I'll link below to where you can, you know, put your name down to join in with them. And um, basically, this is billed as a true story, but I don't believe it is. And I've seen stuff that debunks it. We were actually all talking about that in our email chain. I mean, I still enjoyed it as a book despite that. But it very much feels as though someone's taken bits of reality and just written a novel using them when it's supposed to be like a true account. I think I enjoyed it more than most of the people I, I buddy read it with. And I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. It was written with quite like a hack journalism style. But I actually kind of quite like that and thought it did go well with it. I just don't like the way it's presented as as truth when it's is not but um yeah if you like the amityville horror as a legend and you've seen the movie and stuff you might as well read the book i mean it's not too long or to read or anything so we'll go with this one this is agatha christie partners in crime so this is tommy and tuppence uh i, I guess like her third 
set of characters. So you have Poirot and Marple. Tommy and Tuppence also kind of go into investigation. They actually inherit a detective agency here. And so this is cool because it reminds me of um, Madeline Swan's book in that it's a lot of short stories that all fit together into an overall kind of narrative. So the overall kind of structure is that they've taken over this detective agency. But each chapter of it is like a short story because it's a different case. So that worked really well for me. I really enjoyed the banter they had going between the two of them. I mean, a lot of Christie fans just really don't like Tommy and Tuppence, but I think they're fine. And um, I also liked that they referenced a lot of kind of other detectives. So they even had references to Poirot, which got a bit meta, but we have references to Sherlock Holmes and all that kind of stuff. Basically, they actually take on... Like, they tr pretend to be a different literary detective for each of the cases they take on, which made it a lot of fun as a reader. Still, it did start to drag towards the end. This is another one of those weak 3.5 out of 5s that, um, yeah, started off as a 4 and just lost momentum. And finally, we have In a Dark, Dark Wood by Ruth Ware. And I buddy read this with Brian's bookshelves. I think he was reading it for thriller -a -thon, and I just said, when you pick it up, let me know, and I will also pick it up. So that's what happened. This is Ruth Ware's first book. And uh, for me, it was like uh, the opposite of The Woman in Cabin 10. Because for me, that had like a pretty good first 200 pages. And then a week, 100 final pages. This was the other way around. However, I also thought it had like less, like, sorry, fewer issues with it. Like The Woman in Cabin 10, there was bits like the sexual assault thing. And someone breaking into a house and this stuff that just didn't need to be in the book you know whereas in this it was all fine there was nothing wrong in terms of anything that was included in it it was just a bit slow and I didn't care about the characters too much uh, it also kind of jumps backwards and forwards through time which Brian said he likes I wasn't so much a fan of but I can see why Ruth Ware used it overall the last 100 pages of this book made it worth reading I think and uh, I gave it like a, a 3.75 out of 5. And that brings me to the end of the month because then I started reading two long books which I've almost finished but not quite finished. Before I go I'm going to do my best and worst books of the month. So this will probably not come as too much of a surprise to you. My best book is actually Indisputably Doris by Charles Heathcote. This is the first time I think that an indie book has has come out on top. And my worst book was The Passage by Justin Cronin. Just don't bother with it. Don't bother with it. But yeah, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe if you're new here. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.